Watch how this bowstring has to push its way through the water. The arrow can't flex quite right, and wooden arrows would just float. So imagine trying to swing a sword or an axe or speak some incantation while you can't even breathe. That's why underwater combat in Dungeons and & Dragons and many other games is supposed to feel weird. It's a fish out of water scenario where you're the fish, but the water, uh, the water's there. So today, we're gonna compare the underwater combat rules of D&D, Daggerheart, DC20, and more to see which ideas capture the most fun but weird feeling for your underwater RPG adventures. Because I'm Bob, this is where we learn how to have more fun playing RPGs together, and this video is part of Kraken Week. Organized by Ginny D and Pointy Hat, Kraken Week is a new TTRPG community collaboration where any creator is invited to post about aquatic topics during this first week of July, and the complete Kraken Week playlist is linked below. Check it out. So let's start with Dungeons & Dragons 5e. Noting up front that I have seen the 2024 underwater combat rules, and I'm not allowed to show anything yet, but I can say they're a slightly simplified version of these rules from 2014. Melee weapon attack rolls all have disadvantage. Roll twice, take the lower result. Unless the attacker has a swim speed, or the weapon is a dagger, javelin, short sword, spear, or trident. Now, take a second to think about that. What do each of these weapons have in common? Bingo. They all deal piercing damage. So, according to the D&D rules, they always attack like this. Lunging directly forward, which is a far more efficient way to move in water than swinging through it. Slashing or bludgeoning damage. But yeah. This is tricky to remember because this list of exceptions has exceptions. It doesn't include some notable melee piercing weapons like the rapier, the pike, the lance, which would all use that same lunging motion, unlike the morning star and war pick, which do deal piercing damage, but definitely use a swinging motion. So for the sake of realism, that all checks out. But for the sake of being able to remember it while you're running combat with a bunch of evil fishmen, it would be nice if all piercing melee weapons were treated the same way underwater. Back to ranged weapons, we already saw why even modern bows made of plastic and aluminum are difficult to use underwater, let alone traditional bows made of organic materials which would need serious repairs after being submerged for any length of time. Side note, that's part of why I'm not testing this one myself, even though I own a bow, I don't want to ruin it, <laughs> and maybe more importantly, while I have one friend with an above ground pool, I don't want to accidentally shoot a hole through his pool. But in D&D 5e, ranged weapon attacks automatically miss in their long range, where they would normally have disadvantage, and they have disadvantage in their normal range, unless the weapon is a crossbow or a weapon thrown like a javelin, including a spear, trident, or dart. So that all makes sense to me too. Besides how you could still use a sling underwater at all, like how would this motion, be? this would be utterly ineffective. <laughs> but again, it would be way easier to remember the D&D 5e underwater rules without any of these granular exceptions for individual weapons. And the last main rule for D&D underwater combat is that creatures Wow, that water's cold. Creatures and objects fully immersed in water have resistance to fire damage, which makes plenty of sense and is kind of the best segue into underwater spellcasting, which has zero guidance in the rules of D&D 5e. Our only guidance for underwater spellcasting comes from the days of lead D&D designer Jeremy Crawford replying to tweets asking how stuff works. And he said this about casting spells with verbal components. No rule prohibits verbal components from working underwater. Keep in mind that if you're talking, you're not holding your breath. Hashtag D&D. And he agreed that once you cast a spell with a verbal component, you're now suffocating. And to me, all that makes sense. 
Okay, mostly. Like the one part that kind of tickles my world-building brain is material spell components. Many D&D spells require specific ingredients to cast them, and some spells require water, usually like a droplet of water. So if you're underwater and thereby adding a ton of this ingredient or adding any of this ingredient to every spell, couldn't that throw off the recipe for some of these spells? So obviously I don't, I don't want an official answer that would put us right back into granular rules territory, but from that world building perspective of how magic works, let me know what you think about this down in the comments. Now, while the player's handbook has additional rules for holding your breath, suffocating, the Dungeon Master's Guide has even more rules about underwater stuff, including underwater visibility and even how water depth and pressure affect your characters. And another one, which really got me thinking. After each hour of swimming, a character must succeed on a DC 10 constitution saving throw or gain one level of exhaustion. And I really like this approach because the D&D exhaustion mechanic already includes a penalty to dice rolls, slows your movement, and can knock you out as you get into the higher levels of exhaustion. So it feels like it could be easily used or just tweaked to cover movement underwater, combat rolls, and suffocation, all with one little set of rules from the game's core mechanics. And that game design approach of not tacking on additional rules, just relying heavily on your core mechanics, is why a lot of fantasy TTRPGs don't even have rules for underwater adventure, at least according to my research for this video. So holding off on Daggerheart just for now, we do have other games like Cairn, Maze Rats, Nave 2E, Shadow Dark, EZD6, Index Card RPG, Crown and Skull, The One Ring, Dungeon Crawl Classics, as far as I could find. All of these games give very similar and simple guidance to the GM for underwater adventure. Broadly paraphrasing across these different games, they pretty much mostly say, roll a medium strength or constitution check when holding your breath, suffocating, or swimming in rough water or for long periods. But there was some nuance. Shatterdark states that characters swim at half speed. Okay, I actually like that being stated. Also, swimming requires a strength check in rough water, cool, and we're told it's usually DC 15, nice then make a con check each round to hold your breath, presumably with the GM choosing the DC based on the particular situation. And finally, on a failed con check, take 1d6 damage per round until you exit the hazard. Nice and intuitive, at least to me, because that's how every video game ever handles holding your breath underwater. You can do it for a short period, but then you start taking damage every couple seconds, easy. And surprisingly, this little number, Nave 2E, has rules for both drowning and holding your breath, but I didn't see anything about swimming or fighting underwater. But this reminded me of an observation by RPG designer and fellow YouTube creator Indestructo Boy, who once said that after researching a ton of different games, it seemed like the inclusion of rules for suffocation are a good dividing line between rules light and rules heavy games. Think about it. A rules light game probably doesn't need a rule for something that every game master already understands and could literally test at the game table if needed. Uh, holding your breath, not suffocation or drowning. However, this got me thinking, if I had to choose between an RPG giving me guidance for swimming, fighting underwater, or suffocating, I feel like I would choose to have rules for suffocating because even though it's intuitive, it's an immediate life or death situation for a character, and I think it's nice for the game to provide clear rules about life or death situations that could reasonably come up in a fantasy adventure. If anything, my research here has shown me that it is the inclusion of underwater combat rules that marks a rules-heavy game, because out of the 11 games that I looked into for this video, only two of them actually have a section in the core rules about underwater combat. D&D 5e and one of our D&D killers, DC 20. And as you might expect, DC 20 builds on the rules of D&D 5e using almost the same underwater rules for melee and ranged weapons, but instead of having a whole list of weapons as exceptions, DC 20 has two 
categories of weapons as exceptions, crossbows and spears. So this game has reached a similarly streamlined conclusion to what we said would be nice to happen in D&D 2024. But then DC 20 gives us a whole page about swimming and holding your breath where swimming uses a condition called slowed and a DC table for different types of water, but it all boils down to moving at half speed and making strength checks, just like the other games, but with more guidance. Meanwhile, DC 20 takes a really unique approach to holding your breath by giving each character a breath duration equal to their might stat, so a number something like one to five, and in calm situations, you can hold your breath for that many minutes. But in stressed situations like combat or a chase, you can only hold your breath for that many rounds. Simple and realistic, yet another innovation from DC20 making me rethink how I run my games. Nice. And hey, before we get into the underwater rules of Daggerheart, if you're feeling inspired by any of the cool rules discussed in this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider checking out one of my Oceanic 5e one-shot adventures linked below. King of the Beach is a simple beach town investigation loosely based on Jaws. Belly of the Beast is a classic giant fish dungeon crawl with probably my favorite random dungeon event table that I've ever written, like being inside that giant fish, got to do some crazy stuff. And Stolen by the Sea is actually free on DriveThruRPG and my Patreon, and it's the most likely one of these three modules to end up with an actual underwater combat, combat encounter. <laughs> And we're back to the water for Daggerheart. The current version of this playtest has an optional rule. Attack rolls underwater are made at disadvantage unless it makes sense for a character to fight easily underwater. This is so simple, I love that. And check this out. For any creatures that can't breathe underwater, if you wanna create tension about how long they can hold their breath, you can create a breath countdown die. It says to tick down this timer whenever a PC takes an action, whenever they roll with fear, which you just need to know happens 50% of the time, and tick it down whenever they fail a roll. And this is so cool to me because it is so far removed from D&D, kind of what people wanted with Daggerheart, fully leaning into the story-based style of the creators at Critical Role. You're not losing air based on your score and some stat. You're losing air based on fear and failure hastening your demise. But now, it would be my failure if I didn't mention perhaps the greatest obstacle of underwater combat in Dungeons & Dragons 5e. An open underwater environment is a three-dimensional battlefield which does not translate well to the ever-popular playstyle of 2D grid-based combat, especially if you're playing on a VTT and you can't stack up little pillars or whatever. So check out this video I made about grids and about how all those other games I mentioned today work with a different method that isn't just theater of the mind. But thanks again to Ginny and Pointy Hat for setting up Kraken Week, and huge thanks to the Bob World Builder patrons for supporting what I do. Keep building.